Hi everyone, I'm Boris and I'm a software engineer. I think that's the, the one thing I want to get like super clear. I'm a practitioner. Uh, I'm writing code every single day. Before coming here, I was on the train shipping to Prod and then I got in the room a few minutes late actually. So um, one thing that you will hear me say a lot is that observability without action is just storage. Um, I think the concept of observability over the past kind of 10 years or so is really popular. There are a lot of vendors out there that are, you know, selling observability solutions. Um, but the way it's been working for most of them is you send us a lot of data. We have this BS that is called the three pillars of observability, logs, metrics, and traces. You send these to us, we ingest them, uh, we charge you by how much you send to us. And um, it just stays there because the engineers that are on the floor dealing with bugs every single day are not really using those tools. They are way too complex. They are not approachable. And that's why I say observability without action is, is just storage. We need those storage engines like ClickHouse that we use uh, at baseline, but we also need to give developers the actual means to actually use that data to improve the operation excellence that they are working towards. Oh, and by the way, baseline um, is the company I started. What? A year and a half ago now, um, we are an observability vendor. <laughs> uh, the great thing is that we focus really on the next frontier of the cloud. So everything serverless, everything event driven, everything on the edge, that's where we work the best. Um, and yeah, today I want to tell you a little bit about how we can go from just observability to actually having that usage that people need such that it's not just uh, storage. And one more thing, this is not a sales pitch. We are all engineers here. We want to know how things work behind the scenes. So what is observability? Um, my background actually is in aerodynamics. So I studied aerospace engineering, started my career in aerospace engineering. And one thing that I was doing a lot, I was in Bedford, it's really sad there, um, was testing uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. So I was testing drones, flying them around, getting data and, you know, build models about uh, those drones based on the data that uh, we captured. So that's me, very skinny and very young, uh, flying a drone. The drone is going to fly around. There is a lot, lot of instrumentation out there to capture all of that telemetry data that we need uh, for it wasn't observability at the time. It was really, you know, building mathematical models of these drones. Um, so the plane will land. I will take it out, plug the USB stick on my computer, get all the data and start building those models. I did that for a few years and then I became a software engineer. I joined a startup here in London, super excited. And prod is down. Why? Nobody knows. What do you mean you don't know why prod is down? Like you built it. How is it that you build something and you don't know how it's actually performing in, in production? And I was really shocked by, by that. And I looked around, all the companies had very similar stories where nobody really knew how those emergent systems were actually working. Uh, at that company, I started working on something, but fast forward, baseline started. So observability is about understanding how your software works by looking at its external outputs. When we flew that drone around, we, will collect, we were collecting data about it. So that's the external outputs of the drone. And we will understand exactly what happened during that flight based only on those outputs. We wouldn't need to fly the drone again to get those insights. How do we get there? Who is really small. So how do we get to action in observability? First of all, you need to collect, capture the data basically. So that's the instrumentation phase. We had a lot of sensors in that drone. You need a lot of sensors in your code as well. The second part is collection. We need that data to go from point A, which is your code, to point B, which is somewhere where it's, you know, all together in the same place such that you can do whatever you want with it, ask questions to that data. And then processing, which is super interesting. That's why we use ClickHouse. Uh, visualization is, once that data is produced, collected, processed, you need to be able to visualize it. And visualization, it's not just about pretty dashboards. It's actually being able to ask questions to the data. 
Like the pretty dashboards are the easy way out. It's about interactively all the time being able to query that data really fast and get answers from it. And my favorite one is actually the provisioning uh, at the bottom. And that's where the concept of observability as code uh, that we push a lot at uh, baseline comes into play. So traditionally, your observability vendor will give you a dashboard and a web UI where you can create everything. That is great, but developers don't live in Chrome. Developer leaves, uh, live in VS Code, in Eclipse or whatever IDE that they use. You want to bring that ability to create dashboards, alert, SLOs, etc., in their environment rather than pushing them towards a web interface. And that's where observability as code and provisioning <laughs> comes into play. So during this talk, we'll go through each of these boxes and we will fill them, quotation marks. So instrumentation, as I said, we focus on serverless and the edge and mostly Lambda and you know AWS at the moment. Relatively simple. You have your Lambda function, you add the open telemetry SDK, you collect the data, you ship it to baseline. Um, that's the way we encourage people to do. But not everyone has open telemetry installed already or is, has a team that is familiar with how open telemetry works. So we have a bunch of automatic integrations that capture logs, metrics, traces, but also all those events those who are using EventBridge, for, for example, there are a lot of events that are going through EventBridge, we capture them. When you deploy um, a new service, if you use something like Terra, uh, CloudFormation, there are a lot of events that CloudFormation emits, we capture them. All of those events are going to help you to debug your systems, not just logs, metrics, and traces. So we have the in instrumentation covered. Collection. There are many ways the way we do it is with Kinesis Streams. So it's basically a way to transport data from point A to point B. Kinesis Streams are working very well for us. Um, and we also use Firehose to send the data back into your uh, AWS account in an S3 bucket. You have full control over your telemetry data. It is not locked into baseline. Everything is into your account. So cold data into your account, you can rehydrate whenever you want. Um, and hot data directly into, into baseline. So we have the collection. We are going to keep the processing for the end. That's, that's what's interesting for this uh, meetup. So the provisioning, uh, that's our custom DSL that we put together. Um, that's YAML. You basically have a baseline folder in your repo that defines everything um, for your architecture. So here, for example, is a query that is looking through the Lambda laws, computing the average of the price when the message is error sending the invoice to a workspace. About, I don't know, seven, eight lines of, of YAML, and you get that query running. And we also have support for all your favorite um, infrastructure as code frameworks. So that's provisioning uh, done. For the visualization, I think it's just better if I give a quick demo. It's really, really short. Um, this is baseline. Let's go. Let's start a new query, really. So new query, start from scratch. So here, I'm querying the Lambda logs, just counting them, basically. And I have the count there. What I can add is... I don't know, the maximum of the duration of my Lambda functions, uh, maybe the, I don't know, average of the memory used. And I can add a filter to filter only, uh, I don't know, when there is a cold start. So let's look for init duration. So when cold start, uh, there should be an exist somewhere and I can run that and here we have the count the max duration the average we can add a group by if you want but what's super interesting is that took 20 milliseconds yes it's only 120 rows and 120,000 rows but that's the sort of speed that we are able to to achieve things to um, click house so we know how the visualization works. We have a CLI as well. You can do all of this through the CLI, all those queries, uh, etc. Now we have the visualization, the processing. That's why it becomes interesting. So 
I mean, you could guess, we use ClickHouse. Can we still use this logo? <laughs> so why do we use ClickHouse? Because it's fast. Because it's very fast. And because it's actually freaking fast. Those are, that, that was our benchmark. When I started baseline, I was like, okay, all the other kind of observability vendors, they're able to run those queries, most of them, but slowly, really slowly. So I wanted something that was actually pretty fast. Now, what's, what are the constraints that we have on the data model? First of all, it needs to be schemaless. When someone creates a log or a span or a metric, they don't call baseline and they're like, hey, I'm going to send this data structure, provision a database for me in this data, stru data structure. They just log and it comes to us and we need to index every single field. So it should be schemaless. High cardinality. So request IDs. Uh, I should have done a query with request IDs. Request IDs, millions of request IDs every single day. We need to be able to query against those. It's not about predefining things that you want to be able to query ahead of time and querying against those. Anything should be queryable. Otherwise, it's not really observability. Multi-tenant. Well, we are a vendor. So we kind of have to put things together uh, such that we can manage our cost and fast. So um, our data model, oh, I completely broke the presentation. I will get closer so that I can, I can point. I want to highlight a few things. The first one being the tenant ID. So every single query that is run on our data has a tenant ID, which is customer ID or, or anything like that. And the interesting thing is that we are using the low cardinality um, kind of prefix on the data type, such that that tenant ID is actually not a string, it's stored as a dictionary, and it enables queries to be much, much faster. The other thing that is interesting here is the codec. And I think it was mentioned during the previous talk, uh, almost everything here has a codec and we did the work uh, when defining our data model to really understand what those codecs do so that we can use the right one for the right data type and compress the data as much as possible. Here, you can see a bunch of um, parameters or columns. Um, those columns are columns that are queried off often, right? People will often query trace ID. They will often query call starts like I did. They will often query start time and time duration. We pull these at the root level of the, um, of the data model such that those queries are even faster. Now the question is how do we achieve high cardinality? When data comes to us, we store it into these string.names, string.values, number.names, number.values, boolean.names, boolean.values. Um, let's look a little bit deeper into how these work. For example, this is one log message that we get. Uh, it's a JSON with a message, a few extra parameters, a time, a level, and a request ID. When we get that data, we split it. So the all the keys that were of the, that had values of type string, we store them in string.names. So message, extra source, time, level, and request ID, those were all strings. We store them in that array of strings. Same thing for the values, um, but we make sure that the indices are the same, right? Message is sending to the backend, extra.source is vega, time is 2023 something, uh, level is info and the request ID is that UUID there. Once we've done that, let's say that now someone runs a query where they want here the maximum of the num, so that 143. So they send us a lot of logs in this format and they want to know the maximum of that uh, num. How do we get that? So first of all, we need to find the index of that extra dot num in the string dot names array. And we use the index of function from uh, ClickHouse to basically go into string dot names and find the index of 
you know, extra source. When that is done, we can then use string.values um, and we can then get this value vega. And once we have that value vega, we can apply the same process to extra.num to compute then the maximum of number of values of that index as max extra.num from that table and having a filter where extra.source is vega. So with these array manipulations, we are able to have a schemaless um, ingestion, but having ClickHouse needs a schema, like the table needs a schema. The advantage of this is we are able to do this, but as I said, for all the things that are queried all the time, we put them outside of these array such that the queries are a little bit faster. As you can imagine, those array operations are a bit expensive computationally. So it's not bad, it's still super fast, but for those things that we know that are going to happen again and again and again, we can optimize them. And yeah, the last thing on this uh, page is basically the, um, we have a bloom filter on things like tenant ID or sometimes request ID because they are queried again multiple times a day. The other interesting thing then is what engine do we use? I uh, use replicated merge tree. Uh, merge tree because one, it's one of the simplest ones and two, it's actually pretty powerful and we replicate it because we need redundancy and all of that. Um, and the other interesting thing is our order by. We use tenant ID as the first one because every single query has a tenant ID. And then in this specific case, it's only trace ID, but we might have two or three more like service ID, um, application ID, those sort of things. So now what's the architecture? Um, as I mentioned, um, with replicated merge tree, we run multiple nodes with multiple shards for replication. Um, we use Click Housekeeper. Really, really good. Uh, highly recommend instead of Zookeeper. That was a, a nightmare. But maybe you can tell me uh, if there are uh, drawbacks to, to what we, we have been using with Click Housekeeper. Um, but yeah, this is basically what it looks like. Relatively simple. Two shards. Um, two replicas per shard and a total of four nodes. What it looks like in real life is more like this. Um, basically, we have the four nodes. Uh, we have a load balancer in front. Um, such that we can distribute the load uh, across the four nodes. We have a bucket for um, <laughs> backups and we have another bucket for, we store some of the data in, um, in S3 and some of the data on EBS. Quite tricky, we, but we managed to get that uh, running and it's helping us a, a little bit with cost. So that's our processing uh, complete. And this is what the overall architecture of baseline looks like. So we have the instrumentation, which is collecting the data from, you know, Lambda functions, ECS, Fargate, all of that. Um, the collection, which is a bunch of Kinesis streams pointing all to the same Lambda function. And then we are transforming and processing into ClickHouse, visualization through the CLI, the web console or integrations. And my favorite one, the provisioning, either through our baseline CLI or any of your favorite infrastructure as code uh, provider. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for having me.